Hi there. In this lecture, we see John Homer Stapfer against Capablanca. This is in round 10 of the American National Tournament in 1913. We see an English opening, c4. Knight f6 from Capablanca, knight c3. And he just transposes into a Slav defense, c6. White accepts the transposition in a way after knight f3, d5, e3, e6, now d4. We're in a kind of Slav defense now, semi Slav by transposition. So, yeah, Kevin Planker didn't do anything particularly special against the English opening and has a comfortable position with black, which is widely respected even nowadays. It passes the test of time, this opening. So, knight bd7, we have c takes d5. Now, this actually gives black. A look at the e4 square. You can see this e4 square on this semi open file. Sure, white has semi open file here, and there are upsides for both sides, up and down sides for both sides. But bear in mind, there's a very ambitious plan available to black, which we're about to see. Bishop d6, both sides castle, and white plays bishop d2. Now, Kevin Blanca builds on the e4 square. We see queen c2, and now building on the e4 square again. And the idea of the rook a e1 is to entrench a knight here, knight e4. So this is actually quite nice for black already. We see bishop c1. This looks very, like a very, very passive move. Knight d f6. h3 again looks like a passive move. And it's also, it seems as though this is asking for a g4 break to open up the g file. So because of the kind of passive way that white's played, Kempelanka sees an opportunity here to play in a very aggressive manner. So what move would you not normally consider because of a, it's kind of a rule violation here for 100 points? Is there a rule violating move which if the opponent doesn't play correctly, you're going to have a fantastic game. If the opponent does play the one move which might cause some issues, then fine, that's a different story potentially. So this is a fascinating move. I do find this an absolutely fascinating game example of Capablanca because of this move. Okay, I'm about to reveal g5. Now you might think, well, it's a rule violation because, well, A, pawns don't go backwards. B, it's around the king. And C, there are dark square weaknesses here. The thing is, a weakness is only a weakness if it's exploitable. White would need to somehow amplify the dark square weaknesses. To do that, there are various ways of amplifying dark square weaknesses. One of the key ways is if you have a dark square bishop without a counterpart. Another is if you have accessibility routes. And there's one move and one move only that white should play here to kind of show the weaknesses of this move. Otherwise, it is just a really ambitious move and will get the advantage. But there's a punishing move to try and cast doubt on it to try and expose the costs of this move, the dark square costs. Can you see what the move that white should play? What What is the move that white should play to punish this for 100 points? And it's the only move. If you look with engines, this is the only move with a, a kind of critical look at this game with, with modern end of technology. There's only one move which gives white an advantage. And you can see it's it's about dark square weakness amplification. Okay, I'm about to show it's knight e5. Yeah, this this is why this is doubtful because of this move in particular. If black accepts the gambit, you know, black has lost that dark square bishop. So the, there's a lurking monster here, a dark square bishop without a counterpart, an extreme imbalance in the position. And you might think, well, prove it. Okay, knight e2, bishop f5. Let's say f4 now, we can actually here do better even than knight takes f4. If we play, you know, knight takes f4 is, is fine, but uh, it's not brilliant. You know, it's about even still. But actually, we can even play better than knight takes f4. If, if black plays like this, there are weaknesses here. And we can get onto them with b3. And all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> there's f file, there's diagonal, and look, these weaknesses, which we said were theoretical, are now exploitable. Dark square bishop without a counterpart, 
poking in on the dark squares which have been compromised by the move g5. So if f takes e3, let's look vividly now, bishop b2. And all of a sudden, black's losing material here. You know, queen e6, there's knight d4, forking queen and bishop. You know, this this is actually rather bad. So d4, bishop takes d4. Yeah, it's very, very tasty for white all of a sudden, all of these pressure points. So that was the only move. But the thing is, the opponent didn't do that. It seems every other move that black... That sorry, that white has here would give black a nice advantage every other move, including bishop takes e4, which was played. So this is actually, you know, it's an interesting thing to rem to remember. We're playing against human beings. <laughs> when we're playing against human beings, we can quite often be ambitious and get away with it. We can be naughty. Quite often the opponents, especially the faster time controls, are not going to play the only moves. They're not going to punish the downsides of ambitious moves. So if there is a case where there's an only move, and this is quite often why I play systems which are not supposed to be objectively great, you know, like the reverse tango, but I have huge success because people don't find those critical, you know, tests. Those acid tests, uh, you know, the absolute acid tests. And yeah, the acid test hasn't been found here. We have d takes e4 from Capablanca. In fact, he could even improve this with knight takes e4. This position is beautiful for black. So say knight e5 is tried here, you know, f6, and, you know, this position is going to be great. We're pointing at white's king here quite aggressively, and we've got d5 under lock and key. We can play bishop d5 soon. You know, if queen takes bishop takes c4, this, this is, this is uh, you know, nice. And if we look at this again, you know, if if knight d3 here, we can get it's it's just a nice attacking position. Let's imagine like this. You know, say white wants to play g g4 to stop g4 from black, because this g file could be really really dangerous. That's the thing about this position. So say this position, it's still going to be in in black's favour. These lines are all in black's favour. When black can uh, put the brook on d5, that's a nifty idea as well so anyway d takes e4 was played we have knight h2 this is rather passive play white had to play knight e5 just for equality if nothing else here to try and get some counterplay going along these weakened dark squares so even here it gives white some salvation so for example h4 and then using the dark squares like this with knight f4 it should be an even position and you can see that could be a monster later but no, we have knight h2. So Capablanca has been naughty in this game. Very, very naughty. Very, very, very naughty. But he's getting away with it. This is a raging attack now, g4. So we have knight e2, g takes h3. This is an installment, a form pawn installment for winning end games. this form pawn. h5, king h1. White is just doomed in in virtually all end games now rook g8 b3 knight d5 knight f4 bishop g4 bishop d2 bishop takes f4 e takes f4 rook a e8 so it's a very very strong position bishop e3 and now knight b4 queen d2 rook d8 yeah white is just absolutely pacified here Rook a1, c5, queen c3, knight d5, queen takes c5. This dark square bishop is about to be eliminated, so so much for the dark square bishop without a counterpart here. This this is just eliminated now. And now this rook on the seventh is wonderful. Knight takes g4. Yeah, this is this is getting uh this is absolutely lost for white. Knight takes g4, h takes. So we have a protected outside pass pawn now, protected by the pawn. A wonderful asset. Rook, d, you know, gd1. And here, not minding a pair of rooks coming off. So here, you know, black's plan is essentially to take out g3. And then there's two connected pass pawns. We have b4, a6, putting the brakes on white's queen side for a moment. We have now rook b1. Rook takes a2, b5. This is just harmless. A takes, rook takes. We have rook c2. Rook's behind past pawns. Either yours or the opponent's is the 
Tarash rule of end games. Rook takes b7. Now king g7 actually. So protecting f7. Rook e7. Rook takes c5. Rook takes e4. Now check. So this comes with a check to get a rook to g2. We have rook e5. If f5, yeah, we're just going to play rook takes g3, protecting g4. So rook e5. And now f6, nudging the rook, rook c5, rook takes g3. This is absolutely winning on arrival, this endgame. As Fisher says, you know, quite often Capablanca has won the game in the opening or middle game to have a winning endgame. So Capablanca's legend as a legendary endgame player is sometimes helped by having a winning endgame in the first place. This is absolutely winning with the two connected pass pawns. G3, end of game. So we see, you know, if rook c1, the king can actually come up. You know, this, here's an example where white's well, essentially going to get mated to the pawn squishing the king with king h3 and g2. So anyway, the game ended on g3. So this is actually, for me, a wonderfully exciting game example of an ambitious move and we often face opponents that play ambitious moves and that nagging thing in the back of our mind oh can they really get away with this if you find yourself intuitively asking that question have they you know committed some pawn move which seems to create weaknesses we need to think about amplification strategies pawns don't go backwards they leave weaknesses behind. But how do we actually exploit those weaknesses? We need to amplify them. We might need to sack a pawn. We might might need to get a bishop without a counterpart. So we've got a monster on the dark squares or light squares, a monster bishop. We need to think of ways of amplifying weaknesses if they are created. If we don't amplify those weaknesses, if we don't show demonstrate the costs of the opponent's ambitions, they're going to tear open semi-open files f files g files h files they're going to tear them open and rip us to shreds so when you see an ambitious move we must see the costs we must amplify the costs somehow okay i hope you've enjoyed this one as much as me thanks very much all comments questions likes and subscribes really appreciated thanks very much